Okay, welcome back everybody. We're going to go ahead and dive into chapter 17. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about chapter 17 for a while. Chapter 17 is infection control in the hospital and the home. So let's talk a little bit about infections. There are four stages in the infection process. Stage one is the incubation period. And that is the period where the time after the invasion of the body by the microorganism has happened um, until the onset of the symptoms. Please make a note of this. The duration will vary with the organisms. This is the stage that the organism will multiply. And some viral infections, disease can be transmitted during this period. So what I need you to know about the incubation period is that it is the duration, but the duration will vary with the organisms. This is the stage that the organisms will multiply. Please make a note of that. The second stage is the prodromal stage. The prodromal stage is the time from the onset of vague, non-specific symptoms to the beginning of specific symptoms of the infection. The prodromal symptoms may be an elevated temperature or just a feeling of um, like, I just don't feel well. And I want you to highlight this, the medical term for people who just feel like they feel like they feel gross, they just don't feel good. They're just like, I don't know what's wrong, but I don't feel good. The medical term for that is called malaise. Please write that down and highlight it. It's called malaise, the just not feeling right. Microorganisms most likely to be shed during this infectious stage. Often precautions against spread are not taken because the person may not feel like they're ill yet. So this person is shedding, um, um, this person is shedding disinfection, you know, where other people can get it from them, but they don't know that they're actually sick. So let's talk about stage three. Stage three is the illness period, and that is localized and systemic symptoms appear. They may have a fever, they may have a headache, um, they will complain of signs of malaise, that feeling of just unwell, not feeling good, and disease-specific symptoms after uh, a while will affect the patient. Leukocytosis, of course, we've talked about that. That's when their uh, temperature is gonna go up so they could become febrile. They may have a rash. They may demonstrate some swelling. They could have wound drainage if it is um, an infection due to a wound. They may have diarrhea. Vomiting may also be present. Severity of the illness depends on the virulence of the pathogen and the patient's susceptibility. That is why two people can have the same illness. Two people can have the same bacterial infection. Two people can have the same, you know, um, viral infection and they will behave with it two separate ways okay it depends on the patient's uh virulence of the pathogen and the patient's susceptibility the fourth stage is called the convalescent period the convalescent period begins when the symptoms begin to when the symptoms subside so from beginning of the symptoms to the end and it, is, it extends until the patient has returned to what they consider their normal statute of health. So now let's talk about HCAIs. HCAIs, which we've already started discussing a little bit in the past chapter, that is a healthcare associated infection. And it states just that, it is a healthcare associated infection. Um, these are also termed nosocomial infections, okay? So HCAIs, healthcare associated infection, are also known as nosocomial infections. These are infections that are received at the hospital. They can get them, they meaning the patients, can get these infections through IVs, catheters, and anything like that uh, where we may be going into their bodies or into an area that was 
before sterile and you know the area being dirty do you think they are more prone to infection if they're in the hospital or not do you think patients are the answer is yes Sleep. now I want you to think about this this is another one of my critical thinking questions what is the major thing that can help prevent a nosocomial infection on a bedridden patient giving y'all a few minutes I know some of y'all are thinking wash your hands yes that is correct but another thing that we could do is, is we can help the patient turn cough and deep breathe so that they don't get a um, pneumonia because pneumonias can be a hospital acquired infection if we don't let our patients move so um, we will teach our patients how to do turning coughing deep breathing and it's very important that we teach them to do that every two hours. Please look up in your book under this chapter, the green banner that says health promotion. Please look over that. Now, another big thing that I need you guys to understand is if your patient does come down with a uh, hospital acquired pneumonia, it can still be pointed towards the nurses. To be, to be blamed for this patient getting this. Now let's just say that there's two nurses and there's one nurse who charts that she had the patient to turn and cough and deep breathe and she had that patient to do that every two hours and she charted it. But then on the next nurse shift, she didn't chart any of that. And then the next nurse shift after that didn't chart any of that. Then it appears that that one nurse was not the cause for that hospital uh, um, associated pneumonia. But the nurse that did not chart it, did not document that they did the turn coughing and deep breathing um, to decrease the chance of that patient getting a pneumonia infection, they are part of the reason that the patient did get it. They could say that they uh, did it, but if it was not charted, then the law um, can look at it as is if it wasn't done. Now let's talk about patients who are at risk for HCAIs, which is hospital um, healthcare associated infection, which we also call nosocomial infections. Those patients are surgical patients, uh, patients who have surgical, surgical incisions, artificial airway patients, urinary catheter patients, patients who have an IV, Patients who have implanted prosthetic devices. Patients who receive repeat needle sticks for medication uh, administration or laboratory specimens. And patients who have a compromised immune system. These are all examples of susceptible host. Now let's talk a little bit about infection control. Uses of medical and surgical asepsis and standard precautions to prevent the spread of infections and strict aseptic technique should be used in invasive diagnostic and therapeutic procedures such as IV catheters, any kind of sticks, um, urinary catheters, and surgical procedures. Emphasis is placed on containing microorganisms and preventing the spread of them. That is our job as the nursing and healthcare community. Also with infection control, the number one way to prevent the spread of nosocomial infections is hand washing. The number one way to prevent the spread of nosocomial infections, which is what Healthcare, um, hold on, let me say it, make sure I'm saying all the acronyms correctly. Healthcare associated infections, nosocomial infections. The number one way to decrease them is hand washing. That is also mentioned on that green banner under health promotion. Hand washing should be performed before and after caring for patient, even if it's more than one patient in the room. 
before and after putting on your gloves as well. I did not mention that before in the last chapter, but you need to wash your hands before putting on your gloves and wash your hands when you take your gloves off. And that is also something that we're going to teach you guys to do in the lab when you're doing your skills. Urinary catheters should be uh, below the level of the bladder at all times, which means the urinary bag will hang lower than their bladder. Residual urine should be cleaned from the drainage bag then the when the drainage bag is emptied. So um, when we are clearing a Foley, this statement is basically saying that the urine that is in the bag needs to be drained out and the urine that is in the tube needs to be drained into the bag. We don't want that residual urine sitting in that um, tube because then microorganisms can grow and then head back into the bladder, which is a sterile organ which would lead them to get a bladder infection. We're going to continue with infection control. The ways to prevent HAIs, nosocomial infections, are to turn and assist all patients on bed rest to cough and deep breathe every two hours. Assess IV sites for signs of infection with each patient contact. So that means every time you go into the room, Every time you're in contact with the patient, you need to look at every portal that has been placed inside your patient to make sure that there's no redness, swelling, any signs of infection, warmth. We're gonna use a septic technique for any invasive procedures. We're gonna clean incontinent patients properly and often. And we're going to use a septic technique when suctioning airways. Also, clean incontinent patients promptly. So, if you know the patient is soiled, this is not a time where you will wait or you will say, the A can do it when she gets to it. Or, I'll do it later. No, you are to clean them promptly. And when you're cleaning females, we always clean from front to back. Clean feces also from around indwelling catheters if that patient has a catheter. Sometimes when a patient has a catheter and they have soiled themselves and have bowel movement, people will be so concerned about just cleaning that portion and forget that they need to check and clean around the catheter area if that patient does have one. Infection control involves monitoring diagnostic reports, procedures to contain microorganisms when infection is evident, i.e. number one is hand washing, proper handling of contaminated items, proper sanitizing methods, protection of individuals at high risk for infection, observing for signs and symptoms of infection. So I'm going to break this down just a little bit for you. Monitoring diagnostic reports, knowing who has what infections. That's what I'm saying. Procedures to contain microorganisms when infection is evident. Washing your hands and discarding of anything that is soiled or anything that has come from the infected area properly so that we do not transfer the infection from person to person or place to place. Properly handling contaminated items. For example, we understand that we want to put all the sharps in the sharp containers. We understand that that is going to prevent infection by us not leaving it laying around. We understand that any dirty or soiled linens that may have come in contact with an infected area, we are not going to place it on the floor. We are not going to place it on our clothing. We are going to put it in the correct a plastic bag or hamper that is uh, used for that and then we're going to remove it from the room. We will never take it from the room without it being bagged. 
Proper sanitization methods, depending on whatever the item is, we will make sure that we sanitize it properly. Protection of individuals at high risk for infection. So we're gonna make uh, take proper care of our elderly community. We're gonna take proper care of our uh, immunosuppressed patients. We're gonna pay attention to the patients who have chronic illnesses, more than two um, illnesses we want, like we call them chronically ill. We're gonna pay attention to every patient, but those are the patients who are at higher risk for infection. And we're gonna observe for signs and symptoms of infection. We're gonna do our vital signs. We're gonna to check to see if there's a fever. We're going to check to see if their pulse rate's high. We're gonna to check to see if we see any swelling or um, warmth to an area or pain. Some examples of signs of infection uh, would be that the patient may feel bad, which is, like I said, feeling of just something's not right. Um, the medical term for that is malaise, again. Also an elevated temperature, also an increased white blood cell count, or WBCs. And the term for increased WBCs is leukocytosis. Please make note of that. The term for increased white blood cell count, WBC, or it's called leukocytosis. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of infection control. In 1991, OSHA established regulations to protect healthcare workers from exposure of blood-borne pathogens. OSHA then adopted the CDC's universal precautions with an emphasis on avoiding injury from sharp objects such as needles. When I say the term OSHA, OSHA stands for Occupational Health and Safety Administration. This administration governs factories and other places of business as well as hospitals. OSHA also adopted labeling of biohazard material. Warning labels have to be placed on regulated waste and refrigerated refrigerators or freezers containing blood or other infectious material. Guidelines for patient care contact. Never touch anything with bare hands that comes from a body's surface or a body's cavity, never. Gloves are to be worn from contact with body fluid of any sort, including saliva, urine, feces, and or blood. The only time gloves are not worn is for contact with intact skin or unsoiled articles. Now, I'm gonna stop here and tell you what my nursing students normally say to me when I read that slide. They say, well, Miss Williams, is it okay if I wear gloves anyway because I feel safer wearing gloves um, because I don't know if I'm gonna come in contact with something that may be under them or if they get a skin tear and then I didn't have gloves on and they bleed. Here is the answer. You need to understand that the answer to any test when it comes to that is the only times that gloves are not worn is when skin is intact or when you come in contact with unsoiled articles, okay? But you are not wrong in your practice if you decide to wear gloves even if you know the patient's skin is intact. So I like to make a variance and let you know. Number one, in a testing situation, the correct answer is you do not need to wear gloves if their skin is intact or if the articles are unsoiled. But for your practice as a nurse, if you feel comfortable wearing gloves, then that is okay as well. Okay, 
Now, as we know, hand washing is the best way to prevent nosocomial infections to our patients. And I've discussed already with you when hand washing should be done. Now, in 1991, body substances isolation was um, started being discussed. And this was based on the premises that infection may be pre uh, present before the diagnosis occurs. And we do understand that. The risk of transmission infection for most organisms is greatly from direct contact of the organism by the carrier's hands or by equipment and supplies that they have been soiled by body secretions and used in additional to standard precautions. They are used in addition to standard precautions. That is body substance isolation. There are different isolation types. We'll discuss them on our next slides. And there are two things about the current system. A, infections may be present before diagnostics are done or before the diagnosis is made. Make note of that. B, greatest risk of transmitting infections for most microorganisms come from direct contact by the caregiver's hands. Important to wash your hands all the time. Also, it is on the equipment and supplies that have been soiled by blood, body fluid, and other potential infectious materials. For example, when you get a nurse who needs another IV pump and she goes into somebody else's room and retrieves that IV pump that may not be in use in that room anymore, what should she do? Now, if she looks at it and says, oh, well, it doesn't look like anything is on this IV machine, and then she just carries it from one room to the next room, she is most likely carrying microorganisms. You cannot always see splatters or blood. And as we know, microorganisms are only seen by a microscope. So when we talk about supplies and we talk about objects, they must be cleaned properly because they may be soiled and you could take microorganisms from one room to the next just that easy. Or if you're not cleaning your equipment between patients. Please make note to read box 17-1 and we're going to talk about transmission precaution requirements. So let's talk about airborne precautions. If you have a person who is on an airborne precaution. They are to have a private room with negative air pressure. If no private room is available, they're to be placed in a room with the patient who has the same disease as them. Also, nurse or healthcare worker must wear a respirator mask when entering into that patient's room. Susceptible people should not enter the room at all. If they have to, they must wear a mask. Patients must, must stay in the room, if at all possible. If they have to leave the room for x-ray, they are to wear a surgical mask. Hold on, guys. When the patient has known TB, tuberculosis, the nurse wears a special mask called an N95 that filters out a lot more. As you guys know with COVID now, a lot of the nurses are wearing N95 masks as well. So now let's talk about droplet precautions. For droplet precautions, they use standard precaution. The patient should be in a private room. Now please make a note of this and highlight it. You must wear a mask when working within three feet of this patient. Okay, i.e. wear a mask. But for, for test uh, purposes, 
um, it will get very detailed and it says um, wear a mask when working within three feet of this patient. Transport the patient with a surgical mask on them. That's very important. Now, um, when you have a patient who has a contact precaution, these patients also should have a note on their door, a um, sign on their door. Here are some of the um, processes that are uh, reasons for the contact precautions. If there is a GI tract infection, skin, or a wound infection, if they have RSV or herpes simplex, and for contact precautions, they are to use we are to use standard precautions. Put the patient in a private room. Wear gloves when contact with infectious maternal uh, material. Remove gloves and wash hands after contact with contaminated objects. For sure, we're going to wash our hands all the time. After washing hands, do not touch possible contaminated items that are within the room. So do not touch any items that are within the room. Wear a gown if possibly, if, I'm sorry, wear a gown if the possibility of contact with the infectious surface or material, or if the patient has diarrhea or wound drainage not contained by a dressing. Limit the patient going outside of the room and leave non-critical patient care equipment with the patient. So this patient is to have a disposable stethoscope, a disposable blood pressure cuff, a disposable thermometer. Okay, so for isolation precautions, and when we're dealing with patients and their specimen removals, we will label the specimen container before entering the room. Collect the specimen and place it in a leak-proof container without contaminating the outside of the container or the outside of the biohazard bag. For their linen, we will handle as little as possible. We will roll it up and place it inside the linen hamper inside the patient's room. We never walk out with linen in our hands. Clean or disinfect containers that are visibly contaminated before sending them to the lab. Many labs require the specimen be placed in a biohazard bag. When the linen is two thirds full, we tie it up and we send it to the launder. Some hospitals have, have the water dissolvable linen bags and this reduces um, some of the handling of soil material because then the workers can just throw the whole bag into the washer. Uh, more isolation precautions with the trash. Let's check this here. Uh, disposable soiled equipment should be placed in a plastic bag lining the waste receptacle. A biohazard red bag may be needed for those patients. Um, sharps during the isolation precautions. Of course, we discussed this and you never ever what? You never ever recap a needle. You put that needle in that um, dispose, the sharp disposal. All sharps are dropped into sharp containers, which are placed, um, which should be replaced when they are two thirds full. And we never stick our hands into the sharp container, no matter what you dropped in there ever. 
Trash bags should be sealed when they are about two thirds full, removed and sent to waste collection. If the trash needs to be a double bagged, outside of the bag may be sold at times. Another nurse standing just outside the room can hold open a second bag, holding her hands under the edge of the bag to protect her hands, which should be gloved from soiling. The other nurse carefully places the other bag inside. Now, what PPE do you think both of these nurses should have on when they're dealing with the trash? You got it. They both should be wearing gloves. Now, we never place your hands, like I said, down into the shark container ever. And you must always watch and be super careful when it comes to sharps. I normally tell this story in class, but we're hybrid. Um, I, as a nurse, did receive a, a needle stick kind of early on in my nursing career. I think I had been a nurse, a registered nurse for probably about six, yeah, maybe six or eight years by this time. And it was a extreme emergent situation and I was in the OR doing an emergency C-section and it sharp sticks can happen just this fast. The physician who normally would hand over the cord blood without the needle being on the syringe so that we could test the um, the blood for that baby he was in such a rush and unfortunately I was standing there just with my hand open ready to receive what I believed was going to be a syringe without a needle on it which is the normal common practice and he slammed that needle into my hand and said run the test this baby's been down run the test when he slammed it into my hand, it had the needle on it, and he stuck me in my hand with that needle. When, when both he and I realized right in that second that happened, it's like the room stopped. That patient had no prenatal care. We did not know her. So everything is running through our minds. Immediately. I took that, that needled syringe, I immediately sat it down on a field that we in fact then made it dirty, took off the gloves, immediately went to scrub my hands, bandaged my hands, then we had to put another set of gloves on because then I still had to tend to that baby after we tend to that baby to make sure that baby was going to be safe and alive, then I had to go down to lab and get tested. I had to get tested for two years behind that patient. She didn't have anything, so that was great. But you have to continue to get tested because the infection control nurse has a graph on everybody who has had an incident like that and there is a time period that they say that you need to continue to be tested to make sure that you're safe. Things could happen just that fast. So you must do things the same way, the proper way, every time. Okay, so now let's talk about other equipment that we use during an isolation precaution. Um, other equipment like um, reusable equipment. Reusable equipment is cleaned if visibly soiled then sent to central supply to be disinfected. Um, and we discussed patient placement. Patients in need of transmission precautions should be placed in a private room or with another patient who has the same disease or infection or organism as them. 
Now, after the patient, after you're done with that patient, they're gonna go home. Any disposable equipment like the thermometer, like a disposable blood pressure cuff, that is theirs. You do not take it, clean it, use it for, nope, it is disposable. Once they are gone, it's gone with them. Isolations are usually um, issued, uh, isolation patients are normally issued their own stethoscope and blood pressure cuff, and like I said, they should both be disposable. Institutions measure uh, to protect and enhance the body's nature defense against infections. So we like to protect intact skin, protect mucous membrane um, health by promoting a balanced diet and good oral hygiene and significant fluids. We provide, like to teach them to provide um, opportunities for adequate sleep and rest and decrease stress as much as possible. Now let's talk about some psychological aspects of isolation. When you have a patient who's isolated like that, it can decrease their self-esteem. It will decrease their uh, sensory deprivation. They will have feelings of being isolated and cut off from the world because even though they have a nurse, the nurse cannot come in and out of that room a lot. Um, they may feel like they are dirty or they may uh, blame other people for giving them disinfection. It is important for the nurse to listen to the patient's feelings and to tell him or her um, that you are hearing them and that you understand that they feel lonely and you can do other things to give them some distractors, uh, maybe help them find TV shows they like, um, maybe uh, crossword puzzles, maybe um, any, any craft that will help them pass the time. Or things that, you know, now we're in a, a situation where now, as long as they got a charger and they can be distracted by the social medias or their phones, that helps and we're okay with that. Please make note of this. We like to offer to participate in an activity with him or her for a bit or just sit with them and talk for a while. Um, if you have time to like play a quick game of cards or quick game of checkers, it could really lift their spirits. So please make note of that. So let's talk about protective environment isolation. Let's see here, because I want to tell you guys one thing. Before we move on to that, I'm going to give you guys a little bit. I'm going to see if I can. I like to give... Um, my patients just, I mean, sorry, my students just a little bit of insight of what some of those, um, let's see if I can find it. Hmm. I think that I just may put it up on you guys. Um, that's what I'll do. I'll put it up on a module. I have a cute little acronym that tells you about different isolations um, so that you can just kind of look at it and know what's, what kind of patient should be on contact, what kind of patient should be on um, regular precautions, these type of things. So I'll load that for you guys. So let's talk a little bit about protective environment isolation. Okay, immunocompromised patients require protective isolation for protection from pathogens. They are placed in an isolation room. Where is that? Okay, they're placed in an isolation room. Everyone entering the room must wear a gown, mask, gloves, and a uh, head and shoe covering. No one with an active infection is allowed in that room. So um, protective isolation, there is a special isolation room for patients who are Im uh, immunocompromised. 
which has its own ventilation system and you should wear PPE for contact with this patient. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a few patients who are um, immunocompromised that we would use protective environment isolation for. Patients who are on chemotherapy. Patients who have a very low white blood cell count. Patients who are immunocompromised. We are wanting to use PPE to protect them from us. Now let's talk about infection control in the home. Infections, uh, patients' clothing and linen should be laundered separately in hot water with chlorine, bleach, and dried in a dryer on high or hung outside in the sun for six to eight hours. So their linen, their clothing, bed linen, everything must be washed separately and in hot water. The patient and the family should be taught proper hand washing techniques and teach them to wash their hands very often. The bathroom can be disinfected with a one to 10 bleach and water solution, which we discussed one part bleach, 10 parts water, and their dishes should be washed or soaked in scalding hot water and allowed to air dry. Washing with contamination, um, sorry, washing with combination of chlorine, bleach, and water will kill almost everything. Please look at um, page 252, I believe, and it's box 17-4 for infection prevention in the home. So let's continue with infection control in the home. Um, like I said, dishes um, may be cleaned with the 1 to 10 bleach and water solution. Clean gloves should be used for wound care or dressing changes. And the family does need to be taught that. And you do need to chart that you taught that. They should be um, taught proper methods of removing soiled gloves as well. And the patient's room should be cleaned very frequently. Soil dressings from a patient's wound should be tied up in a plastic bag and discarded immediately. We should teach them what to mark biohazard and where to put their biohazard signs. Um, as we discussed a little while ago, um, if you have a patient who has a, they have needles or syringes that need to be disposed of, we like to put that in a plastic jug that is clean with a um, secured top and we put a biohazard sticker on the front of that. And we like to teach our patients to never do what to needles. Never recap a needle. We also teach them to put uh, one part bleach and 10 parts water inside of that container and allowing sunshine in that patient's room will increase that patient's mood and can decrease the presence of microorganisms. Clean items and dirty items should be kept in different places at all times in the home. Please make note, if a homebound patient has to be um, at the home and doing their own dressing changes, um, it doesn't matter who does it, most importantly, what matters is, is that it's done correctly and that things are discarded correctly and that hand washing is done correctly. Now let's talk a little bit more about the infection control nurse. OSHA regulations protect healthcare workers from occupational exposures to bloodborne pathogens in the workplace. In Canada, it is the Occupational Health and Safety Act, but here is called OSHA. Now some things that will help control infections for the nurse, good hand hygiene, general medical aseptic technique, 
the use of PPE, needleless IV equipment, needleless with guards, I'm sorry, needles with guards, and to always be on your guard and don't ever get careless like the story I just told y'all. OSHA has also advised that all healthcare workers be vaccinated with Hep B vaccine and obstetrical nurses should be vaccinated with rubella. Now, with also with infection control for the nurse, the main mode of exposure to bloodborne pathogens are through the skin, the eye, the mucous membrane, and peritoneal routes. And these are puncture wounds from contaminated needles and other sharps, skin contact, allowing infectious fluids to enter through broken or damaged skin. So that's if the nurse have a cut, you know, um, on her cuticles, on, on her body anywhere. Mucous membrane should be, um, if they're intact, she's going to be fine. Uh, if not, Infectious fluids could enter through the mucous membranes um, of the eyes, the mouth, and the nose. So that's even with splatters, like splatters to your eyes, to your nose, to your mouth. Now, let's go ahead and discuss um, surgical asepsis. There are four rules for surgical asepsis. Know what is sterile. Know what is not sterile. Separate sterile from unsterile things. Remedy contamination immediately. I want you guys to read all of Fox 17-5. Okay? Make sure you read that and understand it. Learn it. There are some strict surgical asepsis rules. They need head covers. Shoe covers. The sterile gown, now this is for uh, surgical asepsis, mask and gloves, sterile dressing change outside the operating room. Um, we will have sterile gloves, a mask, and a sterile field are all being used. The goal in surgical asepsis is to keep free of all microorganisms. You should constantly maintain Principles of surgical asepsis. The surgical scrub is longer and more vigorous than a regular hand washing. The goal is to remove as many microorganisms as possible without damaging your skin. The, the scrub brush, it looks like really... Um, it looks like just a little hand brush. And you must scrub. It is more vigorous, okay, than a regular hand washing. Take a look at that skill. It's on 17-1, um, page 256. Performing a surgical hand scrub. And this is how they do um, scrub their hands in surgery. A good nursing diagnosis for any surgical patient um, would be a risk for infection. The expected outcome for that nursing care plan will be the patient will be free of nosocomial infection during entire hospital stay. Now, when they're doing the surgical scrub, they actually use a packaged scrub brush. And that scrub brush does have soap already applied in it. And it has a little stick in there. And the little stick is used to clean under the fingernails. This hand scrub, like I said, is more lengthier. It is more vigorous. And um, it's usually, you usually scrub your hands for four to six minutes. And the time of that four to six minutes is the time of actual scrubbing. That time does not include the rinsing. Hmm. 
Now we're gonna, and I'm gonna show you guys something. I have a little demonstration here. Um, principles of opening a sterile package. Now when opening a sterile package, you're gonna open it up away from the body and you're gonna touch only the outsides of the wrapper. You do not reach over the sterile fill and it always, um, and you always will face the sterile fill. You will allow at least six inches between the body and the sterile fill. Now, principles of opening a sterile package is you will first wash your hands. Second, open sterile package away from the body. Touch only the outside paper. Do not reach across the fill. And always face the sterile fill. Go around if necessary. Allow sufficient space, at least six inches, between your body and the fill. There are two other procedures used frequently in working with sterile technique. Sterile gloving, which you're going to get a lot of practice with that. Pouring sterile fluids. You're going to also get practice with that. Um, and we will cover this more in depth when we get to some of the skills that are sterile skills. Now, I'm going to show you what it means. I'm going to demonstrate it here. Now, this is a um, Foley catheter kit. And I like to show you guys exactly what I mean. So I'm going to open this up and show you what I'm speaking of. So the first thing I would have done was what? Wash my hands. Okay, we all know that. I have like burned that into your brains by now. Wash your hands. Now, when we're talking about opening a sterile package, we're not talking about this plastic. This plastic is not your sterile package. This plastic is your container, okay? It is your mode of getting this sterile packaging, which is on the inside, okay? Free and clear. So then you're gonna remove it. And we always like to have a receptacle really close to us um, so that we're not moving around and turning our backs on our sterile field to throw things away. Okay, so that's my receptacle there. And then this page here just tells us what all is inside my container. And it tells me what um, this container is. It also has on here where it was made and the lot number and the expiration date. Okay, um, all the information I need to know about what's inside here is written on this page. Okay, so um, throw it in the receptacle. Another thing to decrease um, me from um, moving around too much bacteria is I'm not going to fan my arms around and I never drop my hands below um, my waist ever. Now, in the book when it said that you are going to um, open up the package away from your body, now I'm going to show you what my package looks like. It looks like this. Okay. So this little um, lever here, that is what's going to open it. So when it says you're going to open it away from the body, at least six inches away from your body, you guys are my, are my um, field. You're who I'm working on. So I'm never going to open this up super far away from you. I'm going to open it up where, where I'm trying to work and it is six inches away from me. Now, it does say that you're going to open away from you and you never cross over the field, okay? So I am going to demonstrate. Now y'all are looking at my book. I just wanted to fix this. Okay, so you've seen it. 
and I'm going to open it up away from me. So that means my little whip here is going to go away from me. Do y'all see that? Away from me. The next thing that I'm going to open is the sides. Okay, so then I'm going to still touching the outside paper one side. Outside paper, other side. Outside paper, you see that? That one comes towards me. Now that's all of my sterile stuff on the inside of there. So I'm gonna lift it so y'all can see. Now, we don't normally touch that like that, but I was just holding it so I could show you. So that's what it means and it says you never cross over your field. Anytime you're doing anything in this nursing program and it is about a skill, you are never to do this. You are never to cross anything ever, okay? If you learn that now, you're gonna do yourself a service. Never cross over, okay? And anytime we are opening up any of our sterile supplies, we're gonna always open up what? Away from you, away from you, away from you. Touching the outside paper. This last one comes towards you because you're never gonna do what? Crossover. Y'all got that? We never cross over. So that is what it is referring to when it was teaching us how we were opening up our sterile supplies. Let me go back to that. While I'm all demonstrating. Okay. So I'm glad that I was able to show you guys that. And um, another thing that I'm going to just show you. Excuse me. Let me get my hand sanitizer. Another thing I'm going to show you guys is my, um, these are what your sterile gloves kind of look like. Now these will come in this, content, this package because it's in a whole sterile package. A lot of times when we get a single sterile glove, it comes in a plastic container that house this. All right, it housed this. Now we have people who always struggle with putting on sterile gloves, so I'm gonna teach you guys something. When you open up sterile gloves, it tells you, <laughs> it literally tells you how you're gonna put them on. This one says thumb on left, and this one says thumb on right. Now, I taught you guys what? We are going to wash our hands when we're putting on gloves. Before uh, we put them on, and then we're gonna also wash our hands after we take them off, correct? Now, the demonstration for sterile gloving You see how those gloves are in there, kind of all packaged funny? That's how they're going to be. You will pick that glove up. You are going to make sure it's not lagging on your paper. And you're going to slide your hand in this sterile glove. Now, you are not going to touch all over the glove at all. Now, I like to tell my students, you might not want to wear jewelry when you're learning how to put on sterile gloves. You're not touching any of this anymore that is sterile. Now when you're reaching to get your second glove, there is a cuff there. I'm trying to show you all the cuff. You're going to use this sterile glove to stick your hand 
under that cuff. You see that? Under the cuff. And you're gonna make sure that your fingertips aren't waving everywhere and waving all on this paper. You're gonna pick it up. You're gonna make sure that it is not flailing everywhere and that it is not touching anything else. And you're gonna take proper care to slide your hand into that sterile glove and you're not touching your skin at all. Now you have your sterile gloves on. It is literally that simple, guys. It's gonna seem hard when you first do it, but it's simply that easy. You're gonna keep your hands together. You're gonna to make sure that your hands never drop below your what? Your waist. I call it T-Rexing. Everything should be right around here. T-Rexing everything. Your gloves are on. You got that? So that is the way to put on your sterile gloves. Now I'm gonna just take these off. Now when you take them off, you're supposed to double glove. Double gloving basically means taking off one. You see you're not touching anything. Holding that glove in your hand. And then removing the other glove. They're double gloved inside each other, hence the term double gloving. And then you're gonna throw it away in the receptacle. I'm gonna demonstrate that 50 more times for y'all in real life when we're in the lab. But I wanted to show it to you while I did this lecture part so that you can understand a little bit better what I'm saying. When I'm saying, you know, you wanna open it this way and you wanna put on your gloves that way. Sometimes a visual helps you to understand just a little bit better. Okay, so now the last thing we're gonna talk about on this chapter is uh, application of the nursing process, okay? Um, so application of the nursing process is assessment and that is data collecting, okay? So we're gonna first encounter the patient, assess for signs of infection. The diagnoses that we're gonna use, the nursing diagnoses is infection, um, um, sorry, the nursing diagnosis is risk for infection. Just plainly saying infection is not a nursing diagnosis, it is actually a medical diagnosis. And I'm gonna go into detail with you guys what's the difference between a medical diagnosis and a nursing diagnosis to help you guys out with that, okay? Wounds should be assessed each shift for signs of infection. That is how we continue with our nursing diagnoses and our nursing process. We're gonna monitor the patient's white blood cell count and the temperature. So we're gonna look at their labs and make sure we have those vital signs. And we're gonna check for any lab cultures that may be ordered. You could use risk for infection related to surgical wound, uh, risk for infection related to an open wound, risk for infection related to or uh, a weakened condition. Now there's an um, acronym called NANDA. And NANDA stands for North American Nursing Diagnoses Association. Um, and when we're doing nursing diagnoses, we like to look at the NANDA um, directed nursing diagnoses, okay? There is a care plan on page, um, I wanna say it's 247 through 249, please forgive me if I'm um, forgetting the correct number, where you will see a lot of this and will be um, writing care plans and within our clinical time and care plans are very scary at the beginning but i promise you if you just keep an open mind and tr and try to learn and do some critical thinking with us you will get these care plans right off the bat and then they will continue to grow as your knowledge in nursing continues to grow now we do take them very seriously and each semester we um expect for you to just get better and better and better with your nursing care plans, okay? So um, be sure to read the nursing care plan in your book. Become more familiar with what NANDA is. Um, and of course, we will teach you the nursing process and um, we're gonna want you to learn how to start writing some care plans. Um, when we talk about application of the nursing process, that is the planning portion and the implementing portion. Planning is expected outcomes, 
which would include things like uh, the patient will be free of any nosocomial infections during hospital stay. And implementation is what we call what you're going to do. Okay, so um, what you're going to do is you're going to teach, you're going to carry out the things that you have planned. That's implementing. Implementing is what you're going to do. Planning is where you plan your goal and your ways to get there. Okay? Part of your plan might be uh, to wear PPE or to gather all the equipment before going into the room um, to be ready for things instead of coming in and out of that room so often. Decide what your patient needs to um, do and what they need to have so that you don't make unnecessary trips in and out of the patient's room. That is very important. We waste a lot of time uh, not being prepared and within our nursing program with your clinicals starting from the beginning. We're going to teach you guys how to make sure that you have everything that you need prior to um, you going into that room. That you critically think about uh, what's the clinical goal that you're doing when you go into that room. Okay, now that is the end of this lecture. And so we're going to continue on with um, chapter 18. Okay, we're doing great. Great on time management. Okay, guys, see you in a minute.